Welcome to Judith Sergeant Murray's neighborhood. Judith was born here in Gloucester on May 1st, 1751, into a prominent and wealthy family of merchants and ship captains. Although she's not as well known today, in her lifetime, she corresponded with George and Martha Washington, John and Abigail Adams, and Mercy Otis Warren. In the aftermath of the American Revolution, she became a vocal voice for women's issues in American society. In this house in 1790, in her second floor writing closet, she wrote an essay entitled On the Equality of the Sexes, and she became the first American to publicly proclaim that men and women were equal in American society at the time. She also believed in expanded educational opportunities for women, and she believed that husbands and wives should have separate financial lives and be independent, financially independent of each other. Judith was a woman ahead of her time, and in many ways we are still talking about some of the very same things that she began to articulate in the late 18th century. Judith married her first husband, John Stevens, in 1769, when she was 18 years old. He was 10 years older than her and a ship's captain. For much of their marriage, he was often away at sea and struggled financially, and so this was the first home they were able to own on their own more than 10 years after the start of their marriage. They built their home in an area of Gloucester that was known as Corn Hill. The location of their house situated them in a very bustling and busy section of town. The house is a late Georgian style home and reflected the genteel taste of the time. While most 18th century Americans lived, ate, cooked, and slept in the same great room, in the Stevens home, rooms were differentiated by function. The front rooms on the first floor were designed to receive guests. More private spaces, such as upstairs bedrooms, gave Judith and John a measure of privacy that few of their American counterparts enjoyed. The house, when it was built in 1782, was a strikingly narrow three-story structure with a two-room to each floor layout. The front facade is symmetrical in design, which is a hallmark of Georgian-style architecture. Judith's first marriage was complicated by several issues, one of which was that Judith desperately wanted to be a mother. Judith married young, but she and John Stevens never had children. By the time she moved into this home, she had resigned herself to the fact that she most likely would not become a mother. The Stevens family did take in two nieces of John Stevens, Mary and Anna Plummer, and raise them as their own in this time period. It was in this house, after the American Revolution, that Judith Sargent Murray began to write about issues of women's equality and access to education. She wrote her famous essay on the equality of the sexes in her writing closet on the second floor. She would eventually write essays that would appear in the Massachusetts Magazine and in a compilation of essays that she would title The Gleaner. Her essays focused on topics such as the sudden loss of fortune, the imprisonment of debtors, the unexpected deaths of husbands, and the suffering of lonely wives. During the colonial period, the official center of Gloucester was called the Common, and it was located where Grant Circle and Route 128 now divide Washington Street. A small village sprung up around Harbor Cove to serve the needs of local fishermen. By the early 1700s, a thriving international trade was sending surplus dried codfish to the West Indies and Spain. The ships, warehouses, and wharves of Harbor Cove dominated the area for 100 years, well into the 19th century. Fishing vessels discharged their surplus catch for processing and export, but most ships were berthed in Gloucester's outlying communities, Sandy Bay, Pigeon Cove, Lanes Cove, and Anasquam. Imports from international trade were distributed to other American ports via the coastal trade, and it was revenue from this trade that helped to make Gloucester prosperous. At this time, Main Street was known as Front Street, and the harbor was much closer to this area than it is today. Although Gloucester bought its first fire engines in 1793, it took the Great Fire of 1830 to awaken people to the necessity of greater fire protection. On Thursday, September 16, 1830, a house owned and occupied by Samuel Gilbert on the western end of Front Street, now Main Street, caught fire. At least 27 dwelling houses, along with 43 stores and workshops, most of their contents were entirely destroyed from the town landing to Porter Street. In the 1770s, she and her family became interested in the religious ideas espoused by Universalism. According to local lore, an English sailor named Gregory came to Gloucester, and when he left, he left behind a book of sermons written by Welsh minister James Riley, an early proponent of universalism. Some members of the local congregational church, including Judas' father Winthrop, began to gather quietly to discuss Riley's work. Judas Sergeant Murray may have been attracted to the universalist belief in spiritual equality for men and women, and also the idea of universal salvation. 
The Sargent family's embrace of universalism certainly had a profound impact on Judith Sargent Murray's professional and personal life. Her family invited John Murray, the first universalist minister in the American colonies, to speak in Gloucester in November of 1774. After several visits, Murray settled in Gloucester and preached in private homes, and then in 1780, in a small building funded in part by the Sargent family. This house belonged to William Stevens, which is the home of the parents of John Stevens, Judah's first husband. Before they were able to purchase their Georgian mansion on Middle Street, we know that in the first 10 years or so of their marriage, Judith and John had no permanent home and lived with various relatives. The young couple most likely lived with John's widowed mother here from 1770 to 1778. Judith and John Stevens' marriage was complicated. It was complicated by their lack of children at a time when only around 10% of colonial households were childless. One of the dominant struggles in their marriage, however, related to John Stevens' finances. When William Stevens died, he left an estate that was heavily in debt, debts that John Stevens struggled to pay back. In the spring of 1785, after officially turning over ownership of the Sargent House to his father-in-law, Winthrop Sargent, John Stevens fled Gloucester and his increasing large debts on board a Sargent ship. He landed in St. Eustace Island. In the spring of 1787, John Stevens died in the Caribbean, having endured a stint in debtor's prison on the island, leaving Judith at home in Gloucester as a young, poverty-stricken widow. The winter before John Stevens fled town, we know that Judith and John, and possibly one of their nieces, Anna Plummer, barricaded themselves into their home on Middle Street because of growing fears that creditors would come barging into the home demanding financial reimbursement from John Stevens. Judith in this time period only visited her parents at night to avoid the embarrassment of interacting with neighbors. She slept with the keys to her house under her pillow and refused to open the front door unless she was positive that the visitor on the other side was not another creditor. Although their marriage had never been companionable, when John Stevens died, Judith referred to the time period after his death as a desolating period. Thomas Saunders built this house in 1764. He was Judith Sargent Murray's maternal grandfather and a prominent merchant and ship captain in Gloucester in the time period. You can imagine Judith and her family, who lived close by, visiting her grandparents regularly here when she was younger. Thomas Saunders will die in the house in 1774. We are living through a global pandemic now, and disease is something that 18th century colonial American people knew only too well. One of the greatest disease threats Americans faced in this time period was smallpox. This is Joseph Foster's house. Foster was elected a constable in Gloucester in 1763, and it was Foster's responsibility when a smallpox epidemic in 1764 broke out in Boston to protect the people of Gloucester from what was called at the time an unseen and insidious foe. Foster hired men and put up a guardhouse at the cut to prevent anyone with smallpox from coming into the town. By March of 1764, the epidemic had abated and only seven people died as a result. Boston wasn't so lucky and lost more than 100 people to the epidemic. In 1773, Foster again had to ward off another smallpox epidemic. Judas Sergeant Murray noted in a letter to John Murray in April of 1778 the townspeople had been ordered to stay in their homes once again because of the arrival of smallpox in the area. Judith Sargent Murray chose in 1776, between the two outbreaks in Gloucester in the 1770s, to inoculate herself against the disease. Judith and John Murray would also eventually, despite the risk, inoculate their only surviving child, Julia Maria, as well. I hope you enjoyed walking around Judith Sargent Murray's neighborhood and learning more about Judith and her times. This year, in 2020, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the commemoration of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which gave women the right to vote in the United States. Judith stood near the head of a long line of women who worked for women's equality. The fact that we have the right to vote today can be traced to women like her, who had the courage to speak out when it was socially unacceptable for women to do so. For more information on the Sargent House Museum, as well as tours and upcoming events, visit sergeanthouse.org. We also encourage you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to see what we're up to in the coming months.